afternoon everybody and welcome to another session of our uh, Resilient Pacific seminar series. Uh, this is jointly organized by UH Manoa's Center for Pacific Island Studies and the Institute for Sustainability uh, and Resilience and uh, co-hosted by myself, I am Tarsisius Kabutolaka and my colleague from the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience, McKenna Kaufman. And we've had sessions on a number of issues so far, and we look forward for more sessions in the coming months. But today we're really privileged to have with us somebody who is not new to UH Manoa or to the Pacific Islands region. Uh, and this is Joy Lehu Nani Enomoto. So Joy has a, uh, a complicated background. Uh, she is of course, Kanaka Maole from Hawaii, plus a lot of other identities as well. Uh, and in terms of her professional engagement, she's an archivist, uh, she's an artist, a wonderful artist actually. Uh, we featured her artwork in one of our, the Contemporary Pacific series, so you can see her artwork there. But she's a, also a social justice activist uh, who has worked on a number of issues, including climate change and all kinds of things. And I'm also proud to say that she's an alumni of the Center for Pacific Island Studies, uh, a graduate of our master's program. Um, so today, Joy is gonna be looking at COVID-19 and its impact, particularly on Kanaka Maoli and people of color. And as we all know, uh, although COVID-19 or the coronavirus pandemic is worldwide, its impact on different people, its impact on people is different across the world and across races as well. And so this is an interesting topic and a timely one. Uh, Joy, thank you for accepting our invitation to talk. And uh, uh, before she starts, a couple of housekeeping things. The first is that this session is recorded, but only the speaker and those of us chairing uh, are recorded. Uh, and then the second is that if you have questions, please put it in the question and answer box rather than in the chat box, because otherwise it gets too complicated for us uh, trying to figure out where the discussions and the questions are. So remember, put it in the question and answer box uh, and we'll address them at the end of the talk. So thank you, uh, Joy, and I'll let you take over. Uh, mahalo Tara. Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Joy Lehuanani Inamoto, as Tara said. Uh, I, I'm coming into this talk uh, a little bit flustered. My computer crashed last night, and so I had to scramble to get a new computer this morning. So the PowerPoint and things that I was going to do, uh, that's not happening. So we're going to sit together and speak uh, and talk. Um, and so this will be Quite, quite informal in that sense, but um, it will be hopefully a really good way to engage beyond the screen. Um, and especially in this moment where I'm a little bit angry at technology for crashing on me. Um, so I wanna thank the Center for Pacific Island Studies and the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience for inviting me to speak today. Uh, when I was first invited, you know, when I think around about 2020, uh, 2020 was like three or four years in one year, 
to reflect on it is incredibly challenging, overwhelming. Um, and so I'm just gonna pick apart a few things in terms of how I, how, how, the year, how I started the year um, and how that sort of resonated for me as an artist and as both uh, Kanaka Maoli, but also an African-American woman who's also mixed with Japanese and Scottish and Cato Indian and Punjabi. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's been so much loss this year that um, I feel like we haven't even had the moment to really take the time to mourn. Um, and so I would just like to have maybe 10 seconds of silence first to think about all of those lives that were lost in 2020 um, due to COVID. Um, and also to think about those lives that were also lost to state violence during that time. So just a few minutes, a few seconds to reflect on that. Okay, thank you. Um, so before I even begin thinking about the impacts of COVID-19 on 2020, I need to reflect back to 2019, to the end of 2019. In 2019, I was coming into the year, we were coming into the year, literally coming off the Mauna. Uh, the Mauna Kea movement, uh, the Mauna Kea uprisings, the Mauna Kea uh, stance was still very fresh in my mind and in my body. Uh, it was still something to, it was still going on. Um, and coming out of that, that was still very much, very much coming into 2020. Uh, but in the beginning of 2020, I also uh, was in, there was also the, the sort of, Samoa was in the middle of a pandemic with measles uh, that had started in Aotearoa where over 2000 people had contracted the virus um, and that carried to Fiji and to, um, and to particularly to Samoa and in Samoa uh, where lives were lost, the majority of those lives being children under the age of four, uh, I think over 30 children and so when we think about pandemics, we were already in a place in the Pacific thinking about pandemics again. Um, and I had was in the in January of 2020, I myself and um, Kathy Jetnell Kidner, who is another graduate of the CEPA uh, program, uh, and a, as a major climate change activist from the Marshall Islands, and a dear friend. She and I were in, a, in an exhibition uh, called Inundation. And when I think back to that now, uh, inundation was the perfect word for 2020 because I definitely, we all felt inundated uh, by so many things. In that particular show, we were thinking about climate change. I myself was particularly thinking about uh, militarization and Navy sonar and its impact on the marine environment and on whales. Um, and Kathy was thinking about uh, the impact of climate change uh, and the position the Marshalls has been placed in. Uh, through her poetry, we worked with community members from the Micronesian community to weave baskets uh, to incorporate that into a community space um, and to open up conversations. One of the conversations that we had was at, at uh, uh, was in um, Kaka'ako, was in Kavala Basin. And it's really important, it's now really significant to me that that talk was there. Before the show even had started, I had to fly to Texas because my mother's oldest sister uh, passed away in her night and she was 91. And I, I literally started the year at a funeral. Um, only to come back, to, you know, to, to be able to come back in time to do uh, this art exhibition. 
uh, and one of the locations for the for the uh, for the exhibition or for the the conversation with artists around climate change was a place in Kavala Basin that's close to what people call Point Panic now. But that space, which I didn't realize at the time, actually looked out to where the former Kapiolani home for girls used to be. Um, so I so I should just say that my great grandmother, my my grandfather's mother, grew up on Kalopapa. Uh, she was born on Kalopapa. Uh, her name is Annie Keohopoi Moku Ohalea Kala. Her mother Keoho Kalole came from Hamakua Poko Maui, um, and her Kokua David Poai came with her. And he never contracted the disease. And my, my great-grandmother being born in 1879 um, was one of the first, was among the early um, girls to be taken to Kapiolani girls home away from Kalaupapa. So she was born into a quarantine um, and then taken away even further uh, because she wasn't infected. She must have been, you know, maybe, maybe not even 10 years old when she was taken. And after that, children were taken away as early as two years old, um, her sister included. Uh, but when she was taken to uh, to Kapilani Girls Home, which was then in Kaka'ako and then later relocated to different places in Kalihi. I reflect on the fact that those children, the girls, the girls and, and later in, on in the boys' home were referred to as inmates. They were born into a time of, uh, and, and some of the places that people were quarantined were called detention centers. So it, it made me wonder, uh, were these sites of healing or sites of, um, you know, isolation, right? So when I think about the title for this talk, uh, isolation, I think I, what COVID-19 did uh, was force me to think about quarantine and isolation, not for me so much, but for what it meant for my great grandmother. And then when I reflected back on the women in my family, on my, uh, my grandmother's side, her mother died at the age of 40, like about 44. Uh, and her, and her, her mother's siblings, her aunties, one passed away at 33 and another passed away um, around also in her 40s. Uh, well, one at, uh, I, I'm sorry, at 36 and another, you know, in her 40s, and their mother had passed away at 50. All of these were tied to the overthrow of the kingdom and also the amount of pandemics that were coming into the kingdom at the time. You had no, you had cholera, you had smallpox, you had the bubonic plague, you had Hansen's disease, you had typhoid, you had tuberculosis you had dysentery and the Spanish flu. And so when I think about that, then I think about the ways that pandemics are a part of a Pacific body memory, right? That was the amount that Hawaii were dealing with, but many, like this was also an epidemic that was happening in Aotearoa, these were things that were happening in Fiji and in the Marshalls. The Marshalls was often a station, a way station for ships to quarantine before they came to Hawaii. And then when they came to Hawaii, they had to quarantine again. So the idea of quarantine is very much built into uh, the Kanaka psyche um, and what it means to be separated forcibly by the state, in essence, for your own good. Uh, but there was also a tremendous amount of other things going on there. When the fire that happened in 1900 in Chinatown to block the, to try to prevent the bubonic plague uh, without people realizing it was the rats that carried it, that was rooted in a kind of racism. They, they, they took 
their belongings. They they set them on fire. They uh, things were taken away, uh, and they were seen as the site of of uh, disease. That the fact that that disease was located specifically in one ethnic group is highly problematic, considering there were so many people coming in to the kingdom. And so when I think about as we entered into the shutdown that happened uh, for UH, it happened uh, for University of Hawaii, it happened as we went into spring break. That was about um, March 15th, I believe, of 2020, two days after Breonna Taylor had been murdered by Louisville, um, Kentucky police in her bed where she bled to death. And so when I think about these rising pandemics and also the violent deaths that were occurring uh, at the hands of police um, on black bodies, it was uh, a lot to take in. It was incredibly, uh, I, was, I was teaching an art class at the time uh, and to say to go from teaching an art class in person to teaching it on Zoom was challenging, is to put it mildly. But what we did was make that, an, what, we, what myself and our, my students did was as we knew that this, as we saw COVID rising globally and the panic that that was setting in, we created together a zine. And... Um, we ha I had my students reflect as they were going into the quarantine through making a zine. Uh, a zine is a kind of scrap, you know, you just cut and paste sort of magazine, very quick idea that, that can be made very, very quickly, but you can get a lot of emotion out at the time. And my, my students were traumatized uh, as we all were and, and afraid. And in that moment of being able to create with them it helped, I think, to make that less afraid. And later on, um, after, you know, later on in the summer when I was able to teach that class again, again on Zoom, and this was following the murder of George Floyd. This was following the death of Ahmaud uh, Arbery. Uh, this, these things were, impacting, right? You saw this incredible uprisings, right? And people were, were coming from a place of isolation and then being forced, you know, the, there was an uprising that was happening, right? There was a global uprising happening simultaneously with COVID. Um, and it made me reflect, and once again, I was reflecting not in that moment so much as I was reflecting as so when I was born into HIV, many of us were raised up in the time of the HIV virus. And at the same time, there's Rodney King. And there's these constant moments of where is justice meeting? Why is violence and the state meeting with also rising pandemics? Right, And why is blame being isolated into specific communities? Um, and those are things that I really, really think about as an artist. Like how do you visually right, capture, how do you through poetry, how do you through arts capture those kinds of simultaneous moments, right? Uh, I was thinking the other day that my, my great grandfather who passed away from tuberculosis died on the same day that uh, he died in, in 1914, but that was the same day that Breonna Taylor was killed. Um, and is there, a, is there some sort of relationship there, right? I think about this as, as, as we entered into 2020 and there were rising typhoons Right there was, there were so many storms that were also happening that the weather was exceptional. It was exceptionally hot, and it was exceptionally uh, rainy, or it was exception. It was just beyond, right? And in that, there's also tensions rising, really clear tensions rising, 
to this need to contain bodies, right? This need to not just ask people to wear masks, but to actually arrest people, to uh, give them tickets for violating that, for violating that order. Um, but there's also the need to cut off the island, right? Um, people were very upset that for just a little bit, for just a few months, they couldn't cruise to Hawaii. They couldn't be, they couldn't come as tourists to Hawaii. They couldn't come as tourists to New Zealand. They couldn't come as tourists to so many different places, right? That we needed to isolate in order to survive because our, our resources were fi are finite. Because we were in a place where there was more money being given to the military and COVID was being militarized than there was given to the populace in order to save, to save and protect jobs, to ensure that everyone had healthcare. And even now, and even now as uh, Hawaii is perhaps one of the slowest pace, definitely the slowest place in the United States to get vaccines released. Um, and all of this, you can't think about 2020 and not think about Kalopapa and not think about the measles outbreak in Samoa and not think about um, those Marshallese that are in diaspora in Arkansas who are 65% of those infected with COVID who worked at a particular, po the Ozark pol poultry factory. All of these things are in relationship to the ways in which our, our lands are occupied, but also in the ways that the state still felt the need to contain, right? There was more murder, right? There was a rise of state murder at a time where we were supposed to be isolated. And as black bodies were dying, it brought us out to or to to marches and that was the and the and the need to contain that in so many places right then you saw an uprising of police right and that need to contain because we were violent uh, because we were responding to state violence right we were considered the violent ones one of the most beautiful moments for 2020 for me here in Hawaii was definitely the June 6th march that was the coming together of the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom, but also, uh, and, and high school students who, got, who, who called that, that march. And then there was that combination of so many kia'i from Mauna Kea that also joined that march. That was incredibly significant because so many say, well, what does Black Lives Matter have to do with Oceania? Why are you bringing that issue here? And again, it takes me back to 1900, my great grandmother's sister, who was in the Kalihi Detention Center, as they said then, who was in the Kapilani Girls Home. The numerator for the census of 1900 all of those children were marked as Negro. So from, from the moment the kingdom is occupied, the shifting institutional racism within the kingdom starts to target Hawaiians as, right, right starts to assign blackness to Hawaiians and also begins to criminalize them. They call the children of Kalopapa lawless, right? There was a need to contain and criminalize, right? As much as they were keeping them, you know, uh, from sickness in the same year of 1900, the Kapiolani girls home within the home had a breakout of typhoid fever. Right. So even in the protection from Hansons, they were dealing with the pandemic of typhoid. Right. This is just all of the different things that become body memories for us in the Pacific. 
And that's just Hawaii, right? That's just Hawaii. Uh, I also remember reading that there were there was a, a group of South Sea Islanders that had been brought to Hawaii uh, and they were placed on uh, what was then called Quarantine Island, right? And the idea, I had no idea that South Sea Islanders were ever brought to Hawaii, but reading that and seeing that they were quarantined because of illness that was literally introduced by colonization, right? Their very existence was tied to colonization. And all of those things came into 2020 for me as, um, as, I, as we were, as, you know, as we saw a rising fascism, uh, a fascist ideologies coming up within the United States, you saw incredible levels of violence, you saw um, an, an anti-Asian sentiment, you saw an anti-Muslim uh, sentiment rising, uh, you just saw just an incredible level of um, hate. But in that same moment, in the very beginning of the pandemic, I remember just the incredible levels of mutual aid uh, that people suddenly started going back to their garden, that people turned back to the aina and started planting again, right? Um, and and they started. Uh, people began being really creative about having Zoom parties and having drinks through Zoom and um, finding ways to go and walk together on the beach. If when as soon as you go, as soon as people could be together, they were together um, outside, socially distanced, and that had to be tempered against those who thought that masks were some violent, uh, were some repressive thing against their well-being, because the, the individual was being put before the collective, right? And so, uh, and, th and this is also tempered with like rising, uh, like blind uh, evangelicalism almost. So there was a fervor happening in 2020. There was a, an isolation, like I said, and a containment, but this incredible protest. There was, I've never seen more people come together to, in their frustration, challenge uh, the state's need to repress um, and to deny uh, that, you know, while other parts, you know, while, while we were, were closing off and needing to close Hawaii, there was a rising anger that people's vacations were being messed with. And now that we've reopened, or, or we are slowly reopening, we see a rising uh, amount of infection. And the fact that we're giving vaccines away to people that are visiting is also another source of frustration. So for me as an artist, I've been thinking very deeply about this relationship between time, right? We also, uh, we saw in Guam, the USS Roosevelt, which became this sort of, uh, this ship, which became an incubator of, of illness, of COVID, allowed to dock in Guahan, um, allowed those, those soldiers to be quarantined in hotels, putting the people of Guam, the tomorrows of Guahan at, at risk, the people of Guahan at risk, and called it the, a US safe harbor, but not a safe harbor for the people of, of Guahan. And this was a reflection of the way that COVID became militarized. We know that here in Hawaii, almost like, like $75 million worth of COVID funds went to the military while the, the uh, Department of Public Health got 14 for contact tracing, for, uh, for, for masks, for everything, right? And so we, we saw this rising militarization that the, the National Guard was the ones to uh, do testing stations sometimes, right? And maybe that's okay. At the same time, 
Right now in the US, $750 billion has gone to the US military while everyone isn't vaccinated, while people are still dying every day from COVID. $750 billion for the US military is more than every Pacific nation's national budget, right? Um, and I was doing a, a quick study um, where, where Pacific budgets may, might be, might reach a few billion, right? It might be 9 billion or something. Other parts of the Pacific are in the millions. And I want us to think about the US national budget is seven is in the trillions and 750 billion is going to the military while people are dying from COVID. And while they say we don't have enough vaccine and while they tell us these things, right? So how do you hold that in your body, right? And in the middle of 2020, there was RIMPAC, right? Now RIMPAC doesn't just affect Hawaii, it, uh, it, 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 it actually is just led from Hawaii. And it was, took 11,000 signatures in the work of the Council RIMPAC Coalition of which I work closely with. Um, it took 11,000 signatures and constant pressure on the governor to not, and they didn't, they refused to uh, cancel RIMPAC. They allowed it to be at sea for two weeks instead of the normal six weeks where they would normally get to come on shore and do whatever they want, right? Um, and be able to uh, do, yeah, do what they want. And so that's also happening in the middle of, they still wanted to have military games that would impact Aotearoa, Australia, right? Inviting people from, uh, from Colombia and Indonesia and all these different places, right? Only nine nations showed up. Why? Because all the other nations were sick with COVID. Normally you would have something like 26 countries come. And when you think about that, right? That they still insisted on having something while people were infected in the military. It said very, it said a lot to us about how they feel about the rest of us. If the people that are supposed to defend are actually at the front line of getting sick uh, and you still insist on having military games, right? So these are all things that were, and so in the Council RIMPAC we create, we also did a series of art workshops. One was also a zine workshop. We created a video, uh, a poet, a group of poets came together from all over the Pacific to respond to RIMPAC. And there was, there was that, right? And then for my students that I taught over the summer, they had the, they, they sat very deeply with everything that was happening. And in that class, which was only six weeks long, they created a bond. And in that bond, they were able to work through the, the traumas and the stress and the panic of 2020. Um, those students, one student in particular who had worked for uh, hotels, you know, she, she was praying week to week about how she was gonna be able to take care of her family, right? So, uh, and in that she was, she was struggling with like, what can art do? And by the end of that class, she had a breakthrough moment once she was able to admit that she was afraid. Uh, and she was able to make a beautiful, beautiful collage. Um, another student of mine in that class was able to um, she was, she's, uh, she was African-American and uh, Talai, Talai uh, from the Solomon, um, from um, uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, and she was able to take through that class to combine her feeling both as uh, a woman from PNG, as a, as a descendant of that, 
and her African-American heritage. And she made the most beautiful combined Medi blouse, which, which she hand sewed and combined uh, beads and the influence of Lisa Hilly's work. And then she was able to cover that, that blouse with images of, of those from Black Lives, of, uh, from the Black Lives Matter uprising. And she was able to, for the first time, see her full self in 2020. And so, so those are some, just the some of the things that occurred, the rising, uh, the need to, to continually fund the military um, while their numbers went up and also hide their numbers. There was uh, an exhaustion. And I think that's in a sense where I'll, I'll end is that 2020 left us with the, elect with the US elections, but with so many other things, with the storms, with um, the need to actually, we had to consistently rely on each other where the state failed, right? That need to consistently rely on each other, that is the point of creativity. And so we all in the Pacific are the survivors, right? Are the descendants of those who survived pandemics and occupation. Um, and I think, um, I'm not sure, I think I'm at 40 minutes. I think I might just leave it there um, for now. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank you, Joy, for sharing with us. Uh, I'm gonna open it up for questions. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, box and then we'll address them. Uh, Joy, you, I'll, I'll start off in the, the discussion and others can also chime in, chime in later. As, and you're absolutely right that pandemics are not new to Pacific Islands or to indigenous people around the world. Uh, and in the case of the Pacific, you know, leprosy colonies were found throughout the Pacific uh, in the 1800s and into the 1900s. We have Molokai here in Hawaii, uh, Makungai in Fiji, uh, and also colonies in New Caledonia and other parts of the Pacific Islands. So it's not a new thing, it's something that's been around. Right. One of the interesting things about COVID-19 is that it's not just a health issue, uh, that it is a social justice issue as well. It's a geopolitical issue. So there is a messing of all kinds of issues as a result of this pandemic that we have. Yes. It's an economic issue uh, for a lot of Pacific Island countries whose economies are dependent on tourism uh, and sources of income with trade with outsiders. It's become a real a huge economic challenge and it's a cultural issue as well. Yes. Uh, and and I, I just wanna take a moment and focus on, on Hawaii. Uh, and you started off by mentioning the Mauna movement. Uh, and I'm wondering whether I, I, I know that it has influenced specific places in different ways. But I'm wondering how it has influenced Kanaka Maoli movements uh, of independence, self-determination, uh, and so forth. And if you can speak to that. Well, uh, yeah, great question. Um, it, when, when COVID first hit, there were still some remaining folks up on the Mauna uh, that Need, that were asked to come down, obviously. Uh, be, and the concern was, will the state take advantage of this moment that people are not up there uh, to try and bring the TMT again? Uh, it has, I would say that people are, it, it, it actually created a space for reflection of the Mauna uh, for, for folks who had to come down. Um, they had to then, there, there was new debates happening. Um, where does the Mauna, where does Hawaiian sovereignty um, land in terms of relationship to this conversation around Black Lives Matter? There was a lot of resistance for many Kanaka. Um, and in terms of, um, there was also, there's also this really like a consistent rising distrust of the state um, that people, uh, are losing, uh, that obviously that this was an economic issue, right? That there was many Kanaka losing uh, housing. But another another thing that happened um, through COVID was uh, 
um, and not so much in the in a movement sense, but in the sense of there they started closing. The parks were closed, uh, and and there was there was it was still a moment to try to sweep homeless, and many of the homeless are are um, Kanaka. Uh, the the prisons um, would not release would not release people, and many of the people within the prisons are are Kanaka Maoli, and so uh, in terms of shifting an energy, the shift literally went away almost away from the mauna to think uh, but not but not entirely but to think about this question of uh, as we you know this is a it's a new question not a new question but this question of defunding the police uh, and and what role did the police have i, I think there was some real uh, there was a, an interesting cuz uh, debate there's an ongoing debate about can you critique the police in hawaii can you critique uh, the military, because so many of us are have family in those spaces, um, and so this, that, I think that's something that's really uh, come up. But the the movement itself, I think, during 2020, had a time to has had time to be reflective, but then it was also looking for when um, when Mayor Caldwell decided to go and try to like revive his park. Uh, project, you know, and there was the issue of of Evie or of of grave of bones there, and within a couple of and and it basically forced you know Kanaka out of out of quarantine to go and try to defend that. The putting this so the the need to consistently defend, uh, particularly uh, um, Evie, um, particularly sacred places, um, but that need to constantly defend Aina even when we're in the middle of a pandemic. Right, um, I don't think that's ever left. Like I think that you know, even in the middle of that, you know, people were were showing up in all these different places, right? Um, whether that was Kahuku or wherever, like there was just so many different places. Actually, Kahuku was twenty nineteen, but all these different places where people were waiting to 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 continue, like to not lose sight. Um, and there's also been a number of different webinars and things that have continued to go on, so we don't lose that momentum. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. You're on mute. You're on mute. Thanks. Now I'm, I'm on. I have a question from Tiffany King, uh, okay. and she says, "Thank you, Joy." Your statement that pandemics are a part of the civic body memory is still sitting with me here in, in the room. In other contexts, I have heard you talk about attending, uh, attending to geologic time. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about geologic time and pandemics? Is any of your current or future work taking up geology or geologic time and the pandemic? If so, what kinds of projects? What materials help you think with time in your work? Okay, that's a huge question. Um, I do, I do think about geologic time. Uh, this is actually continuing a conversation that that she and I had. I, I often um, think about the the geology of of atolls versus those of say. Um, Papua New Guinea or, you know, places that are heavily mined is a matter of geologic time. Uh, Hawaii in the world of geology is quite new in the sense that um, it's still erupting and right, and we don't have anything to, like we, we there's nothing to mine um, because it's still growing. Uh, but the resource we did have was water. And so that was the extractive source, um, right? And so when I think about how extraction works, that's where I think about uh, geologic time. Why, if you, if you can't extract something from it, if you can't extract the entire middle of, of it out um, and displace people, then what is that, you know, what are you using the island for? So I'm always thinking about geologic time. Um, but in terms of projects that I'm thinking of right now, I'm thinking about um, just how, um, I'm actually thinking, I didn't actually talk a lot about about uh, Black Lives, uh, but I'm thinking a lot about the ways that we forget uh, how how am, how much amnesia we have around really catastrophic events. So uh, one thing that uh, 
you know, from a personal story is that I found an ancestor who died as a child in one of the largest industrial accidents in the United States in Texas, in Galveston, Texas, that uh, Monsanto in 1947 had ammonium nitrate on two ships that blew up uh, and it hit, or Texas City, and it hit these oil tanks that also blew up and was like the equivalent of uh, what just happened in Beirut. The explosions were so massive that it killed 500 people immediately and injured thousands of others. This is a major event in history and no one really knows about it. It's not really talked about anymore. It's not, it's hardly talked about in the, in Texas city where it happened, but that also gives me a long sense, a longer sense of Monsanto, right? Um, and so I'm thinking a lot about uh, these places where where murder happens uh, or where death happens um, and how that doesn't make it to the postcards, right? So she, uh, she knows that I'm thinking about some postcard projects in terms of how do you remove, how do you take away that, like that sort of romantic idea of a place uh, or show the, the image of, that's, of what's romantic and think about um, what really lies in that landscape. Um, so I'm always thinking about landscapes and, and Aina. And so I'm, I constantly think about um, dirt and um, other detritus of, of, of the moment um, and photographs and how those, how those work. Archival, archival documents um, are incredibly significant um, in terms of thinking about art, my artwork. Uh, thanks, Joy. I have another question from Jamie, Jamie Farris, uh, and she says, thanks, uh, Joy, for sharing beautiful, powerful and powerful stories about your grandmothers and great grandmothers and their early deaths. It speaks to the interrelatedness of police, military and health systems as systems of racial containment. I'm interested uh, in hearing how you were thinking about the balance of relationship between virtual and physical gathering in the context of social justice at this moment, going back to the Aina and making Zin virtually, both seem so important. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can't stand being on Zoom. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I, I think, uh... It's you know Pacific people. We we already work regionally, but um, there's something in being with each other that's it's really difficult to to do all of this through Zoom. However, I will say that, uh, and as we as uh, we've I've also had major issues with the UH and its relationship to Zoom. But um, I will say that Zoom has allowed for conversations uh, or access to conversations that you would have never had before. Um, this, you can now listen to Angela Davis and uh, you know, people from across the world ha having conversations about the rising police state or thinking about uh, global, global, racialized global capitalism or you know, we can have all of these conversations for free where we would normally hear that we'd have to fly to the place. We'd have to hear that in person or pay for the conference. So now we're getting basically free conferences um, we're getting access to information that we never had. Uh, but that means that's if you have access to a computer, right? And as I realized this morning, when my computer completely, like when I had to go out and buy a brand new one, um, the privilege of being able to do that, uh, of being able to set it up and have internet, um, you know, but what would have happened if I, if I suddenly didn't have access to a computer this talk would have never, this talk wouldn't have happened this way. We would have had to figure something else out, right? Or I'd had to delay until I, right? And so it, it's making me acutely aware of the, 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 that need to be on technology is, is I'm losing something very tactile, um, very real and personable that's important. I'd really rather be in a garden. I'd really rather be, um, you know, laughing and, and drinking kava and, and doing other things other than having to convey um, how I feel about things through a screen, um, right? It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't come through in the same way. 
right? Um, so, so yeah, I, I hope that um, I, that's I, I agree with you. I have I have Zoom Kava with uh, friends across the region, and I can tell you, uh, it's not the same as having Kava in person. Um, I have a, a question, and others can also add questions if they want. So one of the discussions around the Pacific Islands region, and uh, a lot of it happened on Zoom, uh, and a lot of it happened during cover sessions on Zoom, is that the COVID-19 has given us the opportunity to rethink what we see as normal, uh, and that there is a, a need to create new normals in the post-Zoom period. Of course, when governments talk about normal, they mean going back to what it was prior to, uh, to, to COVID-19. And I'm wondering whether such discussions are taking place uh, amongst Kanaka Maoli or others here in Hawaii. And I know that some of the cover Zooms that we had include people from here uh, as well. Uh, and the other thing is in places like Fiji, for instance, you know, realizing the economic difficulty that people were going through, they came up with creative ways of helping each other survive. And one of which is something that they call butter for better Fiji, meaning that rather than providing services uh, in exchange for money, you bring in taro to a, a doctor in, in Nandi was accepting taro and other things uh, mm -hmm. to provide health services. Uh, and they created an actual movement called Bata for Better Fiji. Uh, and I'm wondering what your reflections are on these kinds of things. I remember, I remember hearing about that and I was, I, I think for, what, one of the things that was really amazing for Kanaka, like as soon as this happened is that people started growing Kalo again. Like people started, like so people, or, or they continued to, uh, you know, go to their local ear and they, they were just doing, it was, it was almost like, uh, you were like, oh, wait, we have a break. I, I don't actually have to go do this other job. I can actually take, do the things that I would do otherwise. Right. Uh, there was definitely a, like, I definitely saw people, like there was a lot more CSA boxes. There was a lot more people, um, really engaging with, going like doing doing things that they had not they didn't have the time to do before um and and talking about and really and literally bringing each other food right uh, especially if people were living by themselves and they couldn't get out or you know um or if people were sick or something people were literally bringing each other food and that meant that somebody was growing food and there was this, there was these exchanges happening people were bringing each other things or bring um and it wasn't you know um and i think uh julian Uggen just said this the other day. I it wasn't. It didn't feel like a loss of the beloved community, right? It, either I still had. We still had. For for other people, it seemed like oh, you know, I don't know what to do. Like I can't. And for and and the, on the one hand, it was it was it was hard if you couldn't say see family that was far away. But on the other hand, it created these connections that we weren't able. We didn't have the time to do. Right. We were able to. We could have longer conversations with each other. We could um, really cherish the times that we are sitting across each other, with, you know, with a mask on six feet away. Uh, but one of the things that I really did see was this food. There was there was a there, there was definitely a rise of food food exchange. People went back to carving. People were going back to weaving. People were going back to kapa making. So. So, yeah, I think that um, in terms of economy, it's almost like we flexed a muscle that we already knew we had. Uh, it, it was uh, it was like this is the time to actually talk about the economies that matter to us, uh, and so people started having these conversations about what like we we don't want a tourist economy, right? There's there's many Kanaka who are like we've been forced into this, but that's not the economy we want. What else could we do with those hotels, right? So start imagining, you know, um, and not to dislabor, uh, right? I definitely want labor protections, but um, but reimagining like what could these spaces be. Right. Um, when you think about where Kaka'ako is, that was all salt. That was all, those were local ia. Those were salt beds. There's, you know, there were so many different ways to think about the coastline. Uh, so you could suddenly it gave us the space to start reimagining food sovereignty, but not just food sovereignty, 
other ways, familiar ways or returning to ways or and new ways of engaging with this moment. Um, so it wasn't all, I guess it wasn't all devastation, but you know, yeah. But there, but there was still the reality of paying rent and there was still the reality of, um, yeah, staying healthy. Thank you, uh, Joy. Uh, anybody else with a question or comments? There are lots of comments on the uh, discussion section, so you can have a look at those. Uh, if, if there are no questions, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you so much, Joy. This is an important uh, topic and one that we could go on, have conversations about. And in fact, there are lots of conversations that are going on. Uh, but thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for giving up your time to do this. We, we're really privileged to have you. And to our uh, participants, remember we have this uh, series and check out our Center for Pacific Island Studies Facebook page as well as our emails uh, and we'll be announcing the coming talks. So please watch out for us. So thank you to all of you and uh, thank you to Joy uh, for joining us. And bye-bye now. Mahalo. Mahalo.